Well, welcome to everyone joining in. Welcome to the evening. If you would like to say in the chat where you're from, that would be awesome. Gosh, there's so many people joining over 100 already so far. That's great. A lot of interest in this subject, that's for sure. Hey, East End Toronto, Vancouver, BC, Moncton, New Brunswick, Calgary, Alberta, Smithers, BC. This is awesome. What a great, great range of people from across the country. Richmond Hill, Canada, Winnipeg. Oh, someone's raised their hand. Hang on. We're going to have to ask you to put your comments in the in the chat, because the way it's set up, um, we're not gonna be able to talk or, he, or the participants to talk. So if you can actually put your comments in the chat and what we're gonna do also, um, I'll run through this again in a minute when more people have joined, but we're gonna put all our questions, if you can put all your questions in the Q&A section. So if you hover and you see that black bar, you'll see Q&A. So if you can put all of your questions in there and what we'll do is save them to the end of Colleen's presentation and then we will get to them then. So in the chat, please keep telling us where you're from. This is lovely to see people joining in from all across the country. And then keep in mind, questions can go in the Q&A. So if you're not sure where to find that, if you're new to Zoom, just move your mouse around the screen and usually near the bottom part, if you hover, you'll see the black bar and there's an area for Q&A and an area for chat. And if you, if you click to raise your hand, I'm gonna to have to ask you to put your comments in the, in the chat and your questions in the Q&A. That's great. So many people, hello everybody. This is awesome from PEI. Great, I'm from the dog strangled corner of Toronto. <laughs> Bonjour from Montreal, Calgary. That's super. Orleans, Coburg. Okay, well, how are we doing for time? Okay, it's just gone seven my time. So I think we'll get started. So all those, I see those people still joining in. So for those of you who've joined in, um, welcome. We're asking people if you can put where you're from in the comments and it's in the chat function rather. And if you've got questions, if you can put them in the Q&A and if you're not sure where to find either of those, just move your mouse around the screen and then you should see a black bar pop up where you should be able to uh, either click chat and type in hello, where you're from, New Brunswick and Waterloo and Vancouver, Niagara, awesome. <laughs> and then if you can put in the Q&A any questions and I'm gonna save them for the end of Colleen's presentation and then, uh, then we can go through the questions. Awesome. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I am going to stop sharing my screen and Colleen, if you want to share your screen. And while Colleen's doing that, I'm going to introduce our guest speaker, Colleen Cirillo. I'm so thrilled that Colleen is here. And perhaps you might have read um, online Colleen's bio, but just in case you haven't, I'm going to read it out to you now. But Colleen has spent many years in the world of nature interpretation and protection and restoration, including 12 years at the Toronto Region Conservation, two and a half years at Ontario Nature several years as Director of Education at the Toronto Botanical Garden, bringing conservation and sustainability perspective to programs and policies and practices. Colleen served on many environmental committees and boards, including those of Ontario Invasive Plant Council, LEAF and Project Swallowtail. And so long ago, Colleen completed an undergraduate and master's degree in environment and resource studies. And since 2009, she's chaired the Horticultural Outreach Collaborative, which brings together ecologists, horticulturalists to protect native plant diversity in Ontario. The Grow Me Instead Guide, now in its third edition, is their most popular initiative. So with that, I think I'm going to hand the reins over to Colleen. Thank you so much. I'm going to mute myself. And one last point, because a lot of new people have joined in. If you can say hello in the chat, that's awesome. But I'll save your questions for the Q&A, please. So if you hover on your screen, you'll see the Q&A. And that's where we can Keep the questions until Colleen's presentation is done, then we'll go through them. Okay, over to you, Colleen. 
Great. Thanks, Sarah. Can you hear me? Perfect. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. It's exciting to see you all tuning in from across Canada. I'm here in Toronto, and I saw someone put Dog Strangled Corner of Toronto that they were from. The whole city is covered in dog strangling vine and other invasives. So, um, and I just want to say that I'm really still struggling with the invasives here in my garden and in many of the natural areas. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is my experience, not just as a, a person working in the field, but as a gardener and a steward of the land. For some reason, mine's not advancing. Oh, there it goes. So this is the uh, list of topics that I'm going to discuss tonight. Before we go into what is an invasive plant and how, what to do about them, I thought I would start with some definitions. And if you're a naturalist and a gardener, this is going to be old news for you. But just to get us all on the same page on what is an invasive plant, what is a native plant, we'll start with definitions. And I want to say that because Canada is so large and there's so many different types of ecosystems in the country, the list of invasive plants is quite different from one region or province or territory to the other. So, and we only have maybe 45 minutes or so for this presentation. So I can't obviously address them all. I'm going to be addressing four ind individual species and then three ground covers kind of together. If there's time at the end, we can talk about others. But what I wanted to say was if your particularly nasty invasive isn't on the list, you might still find it interesting uh, when we talk about how to deal with invasive ground covers, how to deal with invasive grass-like plants and how to deal with invasive, an invasive shrub, a woody plant. So let's get going. Native plants. So again, I apologize if this is old news, but, and if you talk to 10 different ecologists, you'll probably get 10 slightly different definitions of a native plant, but this is the one that I like to use. A native plant is a plant that has existed in an area for millennia, and it's evolved along with other native species of plants, animals, fungi, and bacteria in the presence of native soils and climatic conditions. Native plants play a foundational role in ecosystems. They provide wildlife with food, shelter, nesting material. Despite their beauty and their ecological importance, they're underrepresented in our gardens and basically kind of unknown to many Canadians. A key aspect of a native plant is that it has a or native plants is they have these connections with our insects and there's something called specialization that's actually quite common among insects especially at the larva stage i have here pictures of monarch butterfly at different stages so we have the butterfly the big picture at the top left we have the little egg so that's a very um, blown up image of a monarch egg the caterpillar or larva and then the beautiful chrysalis and as we likely all know this is an insect that is specialized. It, at its larva stage, it can only consume uh, milkweed plants. So plants in the milkweed family and across Canada, there are maybe three or four of them. Here in Ontario, we have three types of native milkweed. So specialization has to do with chemistry. Our native insects have evolved with our native plants and they have um, through time been able to combat the defenses of native plants. So all plants have chemical defenses to try and stop insects and other creatures from eating them. But the insects that have evolved over time with them have eventually broken down those or been able to combat those, um, those restrictions, those chemicals, they're able to manage them and consume the plants and derive nourishment from them. So even though this is the most popular example, specialization is actually very common and especially at the larva stage. As we know, the monarch adult can derive nourishment from a number of different flowers, but the caterpillar can only consume the leaves of milkweed. So let's talk about non-native, naturalized and invasive plants. A non-native or introduced or alien plant is a plant that's been brought into a region by human activity, whether by accident or on purpose. As the climate changes and landscapes are developed, some non-native plants that are not invasive now might become invasive in the future. And we've seen this happen as they go from the watch list, so non-native plants that are showing some signs of invasiveness, to the invasive list. And every province or territory has its own list of invasive plants and watch list plants. Uh, so, so though it's non-native, they're from another place, but right now at least they're not 
um, threatening ecology, the economy, or human health. Naturalized is a non-native species which has dispersed itself in the region, but still does not pose a serious threat to uh, native species. An invasive plant, on the other hand, is a non-native plant that self-disperses readily in the region and which negatively impacts native biodiversity, the economy, and or society, including human health. So many of the invasive plants or invasive species in general have similar traits or common traits. So they typically have one or more of the following traits. And if you place these invasive, these opportunistic plants in a fragmented or degraded environment, it's no surprise that they're able to take off. Adaptability. So they're able to grow in a variety of soil conditions and habitats. They come from the same or similar climatic conditions. So many of the invasive plants that we see here are from Asia or um, Northern Europe. They lack insect predators. So this speaks to that specialization point that we talked about earlier. So they come here and maybe in their native range, they have all sorts of insects that keep them in check, keep their population in check. And when they come to a new environment, there are no insects keeping their population in check. Rapid growth, a number of invasive plants that we're familiar with have an exceedingly rapid growth. Vegetative spread like goutweed, periwinkle, and English ivy, which are the three invasive ground covers we're going to speak about later. Prolific seed producers. In ideal conditions, one garlic mustard plant, which is a species I'm going to talk about in detail tonight, can produce up to uh, 150 seed pods, and each of those seed pods can contain 22 seeds. A dense population of garlic mustard can produce more than 60,000 seeds per meter squared. So that's a huge amount of seed. Pair that with the fact that the seed lasts for a long time in the soil. Some studies say up to 10 years. You can see how it can really become a problem. Uh, they're early to leaf out or and or they drop their leaves late. So this is this gives them an edge because they can photosynthesize for a longer period of time. They start early in the spring and they go longer into the fall. Garlic mustard keeps its basil leaves green through the winter so it can start producing food for itself very early on. It's green, bright green uh, as the snow disappears here in Toronto. And they're able to change their environment for their benefit. Uh, let's talk about garlic mustard again, which is allopathic. So its roots produce chemicals, including glycosinates and cyanide that change soil chemistry and prevent other species from growing. Some of these chemicals are also present in their leaves, which is why uh, herbivores don't consume them. Dog strangling vine adds high levels of nitrogen to the soil. And that is not really suitable for many of our native plants that like a more low nitrogen environment. Goutweed's tissues contain antifungal chemicals that suppress native plant growth because many of our native plants have a symbiotic relationship with fungi found in the soil. So those are just some examples of the traits that make plants invasive. So there are all sorts of, of impacts of invasive plants at all different scales. And I'll just go through a few of them. So there are 486 invasive alien plants that are known in Canada. So those are plants. If you talk about the number of species, we actually don't know. But back in 2002, it was approximately 1,400 species. So definitely we have way more than that now. And that's all species. But according to uh, 2019, the Canadian Encyclopedia, we have 486 alien plants in Canada. And many of them are on the 100 worst offenders list, like Japanese knotweed, which I'll discuss later. There are many industries that are negatively impacted by invasive species, and I've got some of them listed there. And I'll add fishing and hunting to that list. This is a massive problem, and yet it's a poorly understood problem in some ways, especially when you think of the financial implication of invasive species. A 2019 report by National Geographic stated that more than $1 trillion is spent by governments worldwide on invasive species every year. And a 2019 report by the Invasive Species Center 
estimated the total expenditure by municipalities and conservation authorities to be at about 50.8 million per year. Now, a lot of that money was going to Emerald Ash Borer, which has devastated ashes in Ontario. But the three plants that are identified as being very expensive to manage are buckthorn, phragmites, and dog strangling vine. And those figures don't include private landowners. Those are what government is spending on um, invasive plants. The International Union for the Conservation of Nature puts invasive species as the second uh, reason for endangered species. And the other one is um, habitat loss, the right habitat loss. And we know a lot about plants, uh, native plants, sorry, invasive plants crowding out native plants. That is a picture of American ginseng, which is a plant that is struggling here in Ontario for a number of reasons, including illegal harvest for the roots, which have a, um, they're used for medicinal purposes. But invasive species are also a big problem with this one, especially garlic mustard. And besides um, crowding out native plants, they also degrade wildlife habitat. And I have an example to share with you. Garlic mustard changes leaf litter depth and composition, which degrades habitat for salamanders, mollusks, and some forest insects. And that is research that's been done in, at the Michigan State University right now. And dog strangling vine is a problem for monarchs. That beautiful monarch that we were looking at a few slides earlier, some of the adults will lay their eggs on the dog strangling vine leaf, but when the egg hatches, the caterpillar will not be able to derive nourishment and so will perish on the dog strangling vine. Other problems are erosion, and that has to do with the fact that many of our native plants have these fibrous roots with lots of hairs that can hold soil well. And some of our invasive plants don't have that kind of root system like garlic mustard and Japanese knotweed. I mentioned aesthetics there because for some people they may not be particularly paying attention to ecology, but they do love the fall in Ontario and Quebec with the beautiful colors. But if we allow our woodlands, our forests near urban areas to just be filled with invasives, we will lose maple syrup, but also the beautiful colors that bring in many tourists and that we just enjoy as residents, we enjoy those beautiful colors. And that's because Norway maple and buckthorn that are thriving here in Southern Ontario stay green well into the winter or well into the fall, into the beginning of winter. And they don't change to beautiful colors like our native maples. And certainly we have increased garden work and garden expenses when we're dealing with invasive species. There's so much research that's being done on invasive species, more so in the States than Canada. But I wanted to share just two items with you tonight. Some of you might be familiar with Douglas Talamay. This is his book from 2007. He has a recent book out now, which is called Nature's Last uh, Best Hope. But this one that I that is like my Bible is called Bringing Nature Home. And his work has been so inspiring and many young scientists have been inspired to do similar research. So one of his PhD students a few years ago spent three years studying Carolina chickadee nests in suburbs of Delaware. This is not a Carolina chickadee. This is our native black cap chickadee. I didn't have a picture of a Carolina chickadee. And if you can see in this picture, that chickadee is holding a tiny little larva. My friend Aileen took this picture and I thought it was just adorable. But that little larva is so important for the chicks uh, that the adults are the adults are out looking for that kind of food, the high protein, high fat, soft insects to bring back to their their nests for the chicks. So this young woman, this PhD student, she studied nests for three years, and she watched the Carolina chickadee adults go back and forth to the nest, and they would always bring something back to the nest. So she was surprised when they abandoned the nest, but there were very few chicks that actually fledged. And then when she went and she looked at the nest, she found that the nests were filled with litter and with hard shelled insects and other things that were not uh, consumable for the chicks. So basically, unfortunately, the chicks, many of them had starved. And if you are familiar with Douglas Talamay's work, he often quotes this or gives this number, 9,000 caterpillars, as the number that is necessary for a clutch of chickadees to make it for the 16 days between hatching and fledging. 
9,000 caterpillars. We're not gonna get those caterpillars if we fill our gardens and our settled landscapes with non-native plants. The other PhD research I wanted to mention to you, this one done locally at the University of Toronto, also inspired by Talame, was done by a man named Eric Davies. And he looked at the insect and bird populations in native plants and non-native plants, um, trees that is. So he set up insect traps in both native and non-native maples and had younger students who were also in the same forestry department watch at dusk and dawn the birds that would go into the trees. And two things he found that were very interesting. The native trees hosted more insects and a greater diversity of insects. And in terms of birds, birds went into both the native and non-native trees, but they stayed much longer in the native trees. So what they surmised was that the birds stayed in the native trees longer because they were finding food. And that the non-native trees, birds would go into them but they would quickly realize there's no food here to be had and move on. When we talk about invasive plants, we talk about pathways. So the ways in which in, uh, invasive, the ways in which these plants arrive in new regions. And sometimes they arrive on purpose, like the horticultural industry, we bring them for horticultural purposes. And other times they come by accident. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency is very involved in, in invasive species management here in Toronto, sorry, in Canada. And they estimate that 50% of the known invasive plants in Canada have been introduced through the horticultural pathway. Research in the States shows that 82% of invasive trees and shrubs in North America are introduced through horticulture. So horticulture has been a a big um, pathway and a significant pathway for invasive species for a long time. But it doesn't have to be that way. I'm not down on gardening. I'm a big gardener. I love gardening, but we definitely need to do it differently. We can't garden like we used to back in the 1960s. Our world needs us to help restore nature. Now let's get to some control um, slides. So there are different options for control. And I wanna say up front that I'm, I'm mentioning chemical here, but I won't be talking about chemical. I don't have my license. I've never applied chemicals. I'm not saying they don't have their place, but I'm gonna be talking more about um, what's available to the regular gardener in their own property. So we'll be focusing on mechanical and manual. But I did wanna mention a little bit, uh, provide a little bit of information about the biological control research that's happening in Canada. When you're deciding what kind of control option to implement, there are so many things to consider. Site conditions, the access of that site, the use of that site, the size and the density of your invasion, how well established it is. Has the garlic mustard been there for just one year and it's basil rosettes and you can pull it out and you won't have much of a seed bank or has it been there for 10 years and you're gonna be worried about that seed bank for 10 years. Are there endangered species there that you have to look out for? You certainly don't wanna pull them out. Is there poison ivy there? And you've gotta be very careful not to get a case of poison ivy as you're digging out your dog strangling vine. And I think it's also just to, important just to acknowledge your own personal abilities or capabilities uh, or capacity. We all have busy lives. So whatever we can do is great, but it takes a long time. And it's definitely important to, to ask for help I have a lot of work to do at my in-laws cottage where invasive species have taken hold. And uh, it's a real chore if I do it on my own, but if I bring in friends, it becomes an enjoyable day. Time of year. There are certain species that are better to get at early in the year, especially the soft stem stuff. And then the woody stuff, you might wanna wait until the fall. That uh, link that's down at the bottom is the Invasive Species Center, which is an NGO, a not-for-profit organization. It's not a charity, but it's a not-for-profit organization that is Canada-wide. And there are all sorts of best management practices and other resources um, that for, for all of the invasives or most of the invasives that you find in Canada. I'll just mention that little tiny caterpillar you see in the picture there is the Hypena moth caterpillar. That's a caterpillar that's been released in Ontario since 2014. 
to manage dog strangling vine. And it was tested for 10 years in Canada and the States in labs before it was released. And we're still not certain what impact it's gonna have on dog strangling vine populations. So let's get to our first invasive plant of the night, garlic mustard. This one is all over uh, Ontario, uh, sorry, um, Toronto, where I live, along with dog strangling vine. We have these beautiful ravines in Toronto, but it's quite sad to see how they've been taken over by many of these invasives. So this is native to Europe. It natural range is from England to Italy. Settlers brought it to North America as a food source and a herbal medicine in the 1860s. You can make a pesto from the young leaves, which is tasty. Um, it's invasive across large swaths of North America. In Canada, it's considered invasive in BC, Alberta, Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and PEI. So that's why I wanted to include this one because it has a wide range. I mentioned earlier that it's allelopathic. So it changes soil chemistry by releasing substances that inhibit the growth of other plants. It also suppresses the growth of mycorrhizal fungi, essential to the growth of many of our native plants. This is a picture on the left of the basil leaves that, that the first year plants will put out. So this is a biennial, biennial plant. It has a two year life cycle. In the second year, it produces stems that can reach up to one meter high. And the middle picture shows the more triangular leaves that have a different shape. They're more pointed than the, those rounded basil leaves and the white flowers that have four petals. On the right, you see the uh, seed pods that are like a, like a very thin bean. And each one of those can carry up to 22 seeds. As I mentioned earlier, that basil leaf stays bright green through the year. And as soon as you start, you start to see the snow melting, you will see these basil leaves. And so they're able to start um, photosynthesizing very early in the year. The root, I have a picture of the root, just if you were curious, because I've pulled out a lot of garlic mustard, is often J or S shaped. And so you can see that it's not as um, fibrous as the, the roots of many of our natives. This seasonal identification chart was put together by some master students at U of G Forestry. And that is not to be, that's not written in stone because it changes from year to year when the plant is going to put out its um, flowers and its seeds. And it also changes from uh, one part of Canada to another. But that's a general idea of when things are happening for this plant through the year here in Southern Ontario. So you want to know if your infestation is fairly new and you've got most of those basil roots, uh, sorry, basil leaves, if you really go strong, you might spare yourself uh, 10 years of struggling with garlic mustard. There are a couple of plants that can look like garlic mustard, so you wanna make sure that you ID it properly before you start pulling it out. But one easy thing to do is to just crunch up the leaf, or, um, rub your fingers on the leaves and you'll smell garlic. And that's an easy way to know that it's garlic mustard. But garlic mustard can look like violets, although the shallow teeth um, of a violet and the pointed tip of a violet leaf is different. It can look a little bit like wild ginger, although the leaves are softer and larger and there are no teeth. It can look a little bit like creeping charlie, except the creep creeping charlie leaf is smaller and the plants stay low to the ground. And it also can look like dame's rocket, which is another non-native plant in that the flowers are similar. However, um, the leaves are quite different. So again, one surefire way is to check for that garlic smell. Also, if you see the plant growing as a monoculture, it is most likely garlic mustard. So what do you do if you find this plant? If you have a large infestation, it's hard not to panic, <laughs> but try and map it out and tackle it strategically from the edges or the outside in. So at least you can stop it from spreading, even if you can't eradicate it. If you have a small number of plants and you're aiming for eradication, dig out the plants as best you can, including the roots early in the summer and tamp the soil down in an effort to stop all the seeds in the seed bank from being exposed to the sun. However, that will happen to some degree. 
If you cannot dig because there are too many or it's too hard, then pull or clip when the flowers and young seed pods are out. It's easiest to do this um, in sandy soil or after, uh, after the rain, then your soil is softer. Now you wanna make sure that whatever you pull out, that you cook it in a black plastic bag. Uh, definitely don't compost it. Don't put it out in your yard waste because it is kind of like a, a bi biological or botanical contaminated product. You, you don't wanna put it out there to spread. So visit your municipality's website, go to your plant council's website, all territories or most territories or provinces have an invasive plant council or an invasive species council council and look at their best manage management practices for disposal. Here in Toronto, we're encouraged to put them in the landfill and our plant council also suggests that we put them in black plastic for a couple weeks to kill off seeds before we put them in the landfill. So just to be extra careful. Like with any invasive plant, you have to remain vigilant. The seeds of this plant can last in the soil for up to 10 years. I've been working at my in-laws cottage for five years and I still get new plants every year. Clearly that infestation had been there for a while and the seed bank is full. Once you do get your infestation under control, you can plant aggressive native plants like Canada anemone, Virginia water leaf, asters, goldenrods, Virginia creeper, do some research and find out which are your more aggressive natives. Some of them are allopathic as well. And so those are the ones you might wanna try once you've got the garlic mustard under control. And as I said earlier, it's nice to work with a, with a friend or a neighbor. And it's also really important that if your neighbors have garlic mustard in as uh, respectful a way as possible, you encourage them to manage it or at least cut, the, cut it before it goes to seed because uh, if they are not managing their garlic mustard, it doesn't matter what you do on your property, you're gonna keep getting seed coming onto your property. Dog strangling vine is another invasive plant that is all over Toronto. Um, it's from Eastern Europe, Russia and the Ukraine. It arrived in Northeastern United States in the mid 1800s. It made its way to Ontario by late 1800s. It's invasive in many states and provinces, including Ontario, BC, Alberta, and Quebec. It's a fast growing vine that wraps itself around trees and other plants, or it trails on the ground. The vines can strangle soft stemmed plants and small trees and create thick, thick DSV mats that are hard for anything else to grow through. It adds high levels of nitrogen to the soil which changes soil chemistry, making it difficult for many of our native plants to grow. In Ontario, there is evidence of the monarch butterflies laying eggs on this plant, as I mentioned earlier. One plant can produce 2,400 seeds, uh, sorry, one uh, patch can produce 2,400 seeds, uh, and that's for a meter squared patch of dog strangling vine. And the seeds are easily spread by wind, and new plants can also grow from root fragments. So if you look on the left, that picture is of a, a new plant in the spring emerging. It has a, a beautiful uh, glossy kind of leaf to it, soft glossy leaf. And it comes up, uh, when the flower comes, it's not very noticeable, it's sort of a nondescript flower. But when you get up close, it's kind of pretty. It's a purpley color. On the right, you see it twining around uh, a stem of some kind of tree or shrub and you see the seed pods there. The seed pods, it's part of the milkweed family, so they resemble the seed pods of our native milkweeds, but they're very thin. And I have a picture, here is a picture from the Humber River, which is a, a river in the west part of Toronto. And this is what I see when I go for a walk. For as far as I can see, this is what I see. I see the sumac that are able to, to survive and emerge through that patch of um, dry dog strangling vine, but it isn't being controlled in much of Toronto. And so our natural areas are, this is what they look like in the fall. And you can see the umbrella-like seed, pot, um, seed, the seeds with that umbrella-like fluff all around them and they fly through the air. So it can travel by, it can spread by seed and root fragments. And there we have a timeline for a dog strangling vine, again, produced by the U of T students. 
again, sort of just a guide changing from one place to another in Canada and changing from one year to another. So what can we do if we have this in our yard? Definitely once you know what it is, you want to again, map out the, the area and tackle it from the outside in. If you have a, a small number of plants and you wanna try and go for eradication, dig out the plants, including the roots in early summer, tamp down the soil to try and limit uh, new seeds from taking from germinating. If you can't dig because there's just too many plants it's, and it's too hard, then pull or clip when the flowers and the young seed pods are out. It's easiest to do this if you have light soil, sandy or loam soil. If you don't and it's really hard, you could wait till after the rain to try and pull it out. If you have heavy soil and you're really worried about uh, the seed bank, clip it at the base to minimize soil disturbance. And you can do this from the summer, like all through the summer and to the fall. When you clip though, obviously the roots remain, so you have to be vigilant. Again, you're gonna cook the debris in black plastic uh, before putting it in your landfill, sending it to landfill. Some alternatives you might wanna try. Um, Virginia creeper is a good one here. I noticed uh, when I used to work for the uh, Toronto and Region Conservation Authority that where the Virginia creeper was doing really well in the ravines, there was less uh, dog strangling vine. And goldenrods for sure, they are allelopathic, allelopathic as well. So they're, you're not gonna really see those until later in the summer, but including those in your garden um, and then some lower growing stuff like henna anemone and Virginia water leaf might also work. All right, so let's go. Oh, I wanted to tell you before we go there, I'm gonna go back here for a minute about that hypena moth. So it was U of T and um, I wanna say University of Ottawa, but I'm not sure, but a couple research groups were involved for 10 years on, on um, studying that hypena moth in labs before they released it. And right now it's in a few different test sites in Ontario. Dog strangling vine is on Ontario's uh, Invasive Species Act list. So it's illegal to um, grow this, import it, deposit it, release it, buy or sell or trade it. Now let's go over to uh, three types of invasive ground covers. And I'm gonna talk about them, the control for them together. But first let's, let's talk about each one separately. And you can see that they are problematic in a few different provinces. These are probably familiar to everyone. Periwinkle is native to Europe, but it can be found in gardens and natural areas throughout North America. It's invasive in BC, Ontario, and PEI. Its popularity is based on its ease of care, its dense growth, and its ability to grow in dry shade. It has few pests or diseases outside its native range, which contributes to its invasiveness. It spreads via a shallow root system. Um, it has beautiful shiny evergreen leaves and these lovely purpley blue flowers. Some people say that wintergreen looks like it. I don't know actually if you have wintergreen in the West, but here there's a beautiful native plant called wintergreen. But if you wanna know for sure that it's wintergreen, you just have to take a leaf, cut it, and you'll smell a nice minty, you'll have a nice minty smell, and then you'll know it's not periwinkle, you don't need to dig it out. Um, another lookalike is partridge berry, another native low growing plant here in Ontario. <clears throat> but the flowers are completely different, they're white, and there are red berries that come after the flowers. All right, so now we're gonna talk about English ivy, which is at the bottom there. It's native to Europe and Western Asia, and it's been developed into hundreds of varieties. It's a very common garden plant. And in Canada, it's considered invasive in British Columbia and Ontario. Although technically a vine, this evergreen perennial is commonly used as a ground cover in dense shade. Whether in shade or sun, English ivy thrives and spreads vegetatively through its long vines that root at the nodes in almost any soil type. It's easy to ID with its strong vines and waxy three to five lobed evergreen leaves. And goutweed, which is on the top right, is native to Eurasia. It's invasive in lower mainland BC, Ontario and Newfoundland. Traditionally, it was used as a medicine to treat gout 
and arthritis. Some people might know it as Bishop's weed or snow on the mountain. It's a perennial ground cover that tolerates, uh, tolerates a wide range of soil conditions as well as disturbed sites. And there are many of those these days. It's highly shade tolerant and competitive once established, spreading by underground stems called rhizomes. It can grow up to 90 centimeters in one year. And just as a description, it's a flat topped, it has flat topped umbrella like flowers, flower heads with many small white flowers. It has alternate compound leaves with serrated edges. And sometimes it's variegated like in this picture, but other times it can be solid green or even a solid cream color. Lookalikes include water hemlock, although that's found in wet areas. Angelica, which has similar leaves, but it gets much taller. And golden Alexander, which is a rather uncommon native plant here in uh, Southern Ontario. But it has a yellow flower as opposed to a white one and deeper tooth leaves. I already mentioned this, but I'll mention it again that gout weeds tissues contain chemical substances that have been shown to be antifungal. So if you find, if you have these ground covers in your garden and you're trying to remove them, you, you know how tenacious they can be. So these are some tips <laughs> for you. Again, if you have a big area, you wanna start from the outside in so that at least the infestation isn't growing while you try and work on it year by year. If you have a small patch, you can uh, carefully repeat hand pulling or digging up of the entire plant, including the roots or the rhizomes. For English ivy, it has shallow roots and strong stems, stems and you can use that to your advantage. Um, it, makes it, it makes it easier to dig it out um, or you can cut and roll it like a carpet. So have a few people go with you to one edge of the infestation, all of you with gloves and shears and cut and roll it as if it's a carpet and then get rid of it. Rake the land, the ground and any little pieces still there, pull them out. You can also mow, that's an option too. Again, if you have a large patch and it's a monoculture because obviously mowing will remove all of the plants. Um, above ground parts of the plants. So if you have a large patch of, gar of gout weed, try mowing it soon after the leaves emerge in the spring, and that way you're depleting the carbohydrate, carbohydrate reserves of the plant. You can also tarp uh, the area. You can do that after mowing, that's a good option if you don't mind the way that the tarp looks, knowing that unfortunately when you do that, you remove all of the habitat value of that part of the land, part of your garden. But if you can tolerate tarping, that might be a good option for uh, a full year. You can cover it with mulch and maybe put some pots of plants on top of it. At the edges of the infestations, you could, if you, if you can dig this deep, dig about two feet down and put, uh, have a little bit of a trench in between where the infestation is and the rest of your garden is. And you can even put a barrier of one sort or another. English ivy on trees. I have a picture in the next slide, the bottom right there. That's of a tree in BC. So I was visiting relatives in BC and we went up to a place called Harrison Hot Springs, which was lovely. Uh, but so many trees were covered in um, English ivy like this. And I don't see this as much in Ontario, but everywhere I go in BC, I, I see this. So I wanted to put a little something in about trees and English ivy, even though I have no experience of removing it from trees. So what I have read is that um, you want to make sure that you, you want to kind of get rid of some of the leaves first so you can actually see the vines that are on the tree. And then using um, shears, you want to clip the small vines all around the tree. And then you can use something like a machete, if you're careful, to work on the bigger vines. And so that you've removed, you've got space between the bottom of the vines that you can pull out, hopefully you can pull them out, or if you can't, you leave them, and then the top vines, and not removing the actual vines because that could do damage to the bark, but letting the stuff that's no longer connected to the roots just stay in place and die off, dry up and die off. So it's about giving like a, having a space between the bottom part of the vine and the top part of the vine. And then clearing, if you can, um, the English ivy that's on the ground surrounding the, the tree so that you don't have more just coming up and taking over where you've removed it. 
obviously, again, you need to be vigilant and dispose of your um, debris in a responsible way. So all of these, spread, these species spread vegetatively, and they're less likely to be a problem if you put them in containers or if you're in a city away from natural areas. However, I still would limit their use because they don't support native insects and birds. The Ontario Invasive Plant Council is right now working on a best management practices for invasive species. And most definitely these three will be in that best management practices resource. The other picture here is a picture of goutweed. When it comes up in the ravines in Toronto, it's often a solid green. And so some people don't recognize it. And I'm not quite sure why that is. I need to ask a, a botanist why that is, but it reverts to a solid green where it's variegated in the gardens at the top of the ravine. It's coming in and taking over in the ravines. And so there you can see a slope that's almost entirely goutweed. There are some great alternatives, so many great native alternatives to these ground covers. I have a few featured here. In Ontario, some good alternatives are wild ginger, mayapple, Virginia water leaf, and foam flower. That would be for shade. Wild strawberry and canid anemone for sun. And wild geranium would be great for partial shade. And I would encourage you to take a look at this guide, Grow Me Instead. And um, a number of um, provinces have a Grow Me Instead guide. Near the end of my presentation, I'll, I'll show you pictures of them. And in BC, some alternatives include salal and deer fern in place of English ivy, woodland strawberry, bunchberry, false lily of the valley in place of periwinkle, and foam flower in place of goutweed. And British Columbia has a Grow Me Instead guide. Both of these, both of those are available online. Um, there are hard copies too, but it's hard to get those now because we don't have events anymore. But you can go and access those guides online. And all of the ones that I've mentioned, yes, they're aggressive, but I would not consider them invasive. They're native and they have so many connections to native insects. So I saw in the comments that someone wanted us to talk about Japanese knotweed and here in Toronto, how could you not talk about Japanese knotweed? It's so prolific. So this is a bamboo-like plant that's native to Eastern Asia. It was introduced to North America in the 1800s as an ornamental species and also planted for erosion control and livestock food. Since then, it has spread throughout the US and Canada. Japanese knotweed is, not, is well established in Eastern Canada from Ontario to Newfoundland and is also found in Manitoba, Alberta, and BC. Here in Southern Ontario, I see it along roadways and in alleys, in gardens and parks, on the shores of lakes and rivers, in floodplains, and in abandoned construction sites. Japanese knotweed is often mistaken for bamboo. However, it is easily distinguished by its broad leaves. See, it has those broad leaves that you can see in some of those pictures. And also it can survive our harsh Canadian winters. Its persistence is in large part due to its vigorous root system, which can spread nearly 10 meters from the parent plant, parent stem, and grow through concrete and asphalt. So the one picture, the big picture of Japanese knotweed in the summer was taken along Lake Ontario. And unfortunately there are patches of Lake Ontario, the shoreline that is filled with invasives, this being one of them. And you can see those small white or creamy white flowers. The picture at the top is taken in an alley by my house. So in the older parts of Toronto, there are alleys behind the houses and Japanese knotweed grows very well in those alleys. And I think most homeowners don't have any idea what it is and try to ignore it. And uh, we have a neighbor that put in a new garage and before they put it in, I said, you should deal with the knotweed and they didn't. And they put down asphalt and the, like a week later, the Japanese knotweed just burst through the asphalt. They did it a second time and the same thing happened. And then they went and put down concrete. So I thought, oh my gosh, they've wasted a lot of material and probably a lot of money in UK, it's such a problem for foundations of houses that you can't sell your house without disclosing you have knotweed. One way to, uh, other than the bamboo-like stems, another way that you can determine if it's, gout, if it's uh, knotweed is by looking at it in the wintertime, it has these reddish stems. So at the bottom right, you see goutweed 
in winter time in um, just outside of uh, Toronto. So it emerges in May and when it emerges in May, it looks like big asparagus. And I wanted to show you this book by Ellen Zakos. It's called Backyard Forager. And she takes these plants that we take for granted. We see all over the place like hostas and this one, Japanese knotweed. And she tells us how we can cook with them, bake with them. I haven't done this, so I'm not recommending it, but she uses uh, fresh Japanese knotweed sprouts. Like in the springtime, she'll clip them and use them in place of uh, rhubarb. So she'll make pies with them or crisps. It can reach up to three meters tall. So it starts off small like that and then can get up to three meters tall. Uh, and there are a couple other, or two or three other knotweeds in uh, Canada that are also from Asia, including giant, bohemian and Himalayan knotweed. They're all from Asia and they all kind of look like bamboo. And they're either on the watch list or the invasive species list for a number of provinces. Uh, so what else can I say about this? I might be going a little long, so I'm gonna move along quickly here. Um, so some impacts. So this is a lot of work for gardeners to get rid of. Let's talk about how to control it. So once you know that you've got Japanese knotweed and it's pretty easy to see it, uh, to, to determine whether you have it or not, you want to be very careful when you're removing it because it can grow from a little fragment of root. It can grow very easily. If you're near water, you want to be really careful. In the garden, you want to cut stems every two to three weeks as soon as the plant appears in the spring, usually April. And you want to continue this through to the fall. You'll notice that in the fall, the growth is going to slow down. And so your cutting can slow down as well. New stems can be eaten, as I mentioned. Um, you want to make sure that you get all the rhizomes when you're digging it out, especially if you're by water and you want to dispose of it again with the black plastic uh, and then in the landfill site. You can dig a trench around the area where you have knotweed and then sink a sturdy liner down into the soil to prevent it from spreading. Remember that it can spread up to 10 meters from a parent plant. Let's talk about common buckthorn. Um, invasive in a number of provinces, as you can see. The picture on the top left is of a female bluebird consuming the berries of buckthorn. Uh, here in the fall, we often see birds eating buckthorn in Toronto. It's not because that's a particularly nutritious or desirable plant, far from it, uh, food, but it's often the only thing. Uh, I live near High Park, which is a beautiful park in Toronto, but the understory is, there's just so much of this one shrub that berry, and it's a prolific berry producer, but those berries have a laxative effect on birds. And so the birds will consume it because there's nothing else for them to consume and they will poop it out. And the seeds are viable as they pass through the gut, they still remain viable as they pass through the bird's gut. So you often see this growing in thickets under wires because the birds will sit on the wires, poop out the seeds, and then the plants will grow up. Um, it has, if, you want, if you're wondering if you have this, plants in your garden. It's a woody plant. It's a shrub or a small tree. It has those ovate shaped leaves with, with sharp little teeth, the, the dark berries that come in the fall. The twigs have pointed, they have thorns at the tips of them. So that's another identification um, tip for you. The females only produce, the females only of common buckthorn produce berries. So if you have a number of these on your property and you're not sure where to begin, Focus on removing the females because then at least you're um, preventing the, the seeds from moving around. What else can we say about control? In Toronto, uh, the city of Toronto, so Toronto Forestry, it, it does a lot of cutting of buckthorn and they often bring in volunteers to cut or to dig it out using a reed wrench, a weed wrench. But after they're cut, if they're cutting them instead of pulling them out, they will treat the stump with a herbicide. So I've never done that. And thankfully I haven't had buckthorn on my, in my garden or at the cottage that I visit. But one thing they're trying right now in Toronto, and I'm not sure if they're gonna try it in other places is a, a biocontrol for buckthorn. It's a, a naturally occurring fungus that they're painting onto the stump after they cut it. It will take up to two years to determine if, the, if, the, um, if this type of control is, is gonna actually be successful. 
but there's a lot of aversion to herbicides. So I think they're trying this to see, is this a way they can reduce their herbicide use in a very urban environment? If you're able to pull out small seedlings of buckthorn, you want to make sure that you tamp down the so soil after again to try and prevent the seeds from, um, from getting the sun and germinating. All right, let's see. Uh, there's a cool project in uh, at the University of Minnesota called Cover It Up. And if you have buckthorn and you want to learn more about this, I'd encourage you to, to look it up. It's all about using plants to control buckthorn, trying to create buckthorn resistant environments. So buckthorn, it, it leaves out early, it keeps its leaves late, it produces a dense shade. So the researchers are looking at native plants that have those same characteristics and then replacing the the buckthorn with them. So one plant that they're they're finding good success with is the red elderberry because of the way it grows and its phenology. It's, it's a long leafed out period for the, the elderberry as well. Disposal of plants. So I've talked about this a little bit already, but just to, to summarize, um, you have different considerations when you're disposing of plants, but you wanna make sure that all your reproductive parts are disposed of carefully. Uh, so put them in the garbage, don't put them out for year, yard waste. Please don't put them in your compost. Don't dump them in a natural area, which I've seen happen a lot um, in the ravines in Toronto. And then that's how we get gout weed and periwinkle through the ravines. Um, one thing we can do too, all of us is advocate for better disposal because nobody feels good about using all that black plastic and sending stuff um, long distances. We don't want more garbage. So what can we do locally to manage this waste, this waste that we know will only increase in, in amount? Uh, I wanted to mention one thing, a, a good option that's being done here at the Royal Botanical Garden in Hamilton, Ontario. They have a big pit and they put all their uh, invasive species in there and cover it up. And after a few years, they get a company to come and remove that material and then compost it. Most home gardeners can't do anything like that, but we need to demand that our municipalities have a better process in place so that we're not making more uh, garbage for the landfill. So summary of the approach, you wanna educate yourself and your neighbors, find neighbors that are interested that you can work with. You need to work together because the seeds, the plants move from one property to another. Vigilance is our best defense, um, looking out for new evasions and staying on top of existing ones. Becoming familiar with which invasive plants that exist in your neighborhood is really important because they might not be in your garden now, but they might be on their way. Reporting what you find is important and the next slide is I'm gonna talk about that. Using your consumer power, so promoting the native plant nurseries and, um, and asking for the more big box stores to incorporate locally grown, locally uh, sourced native plants and to remove the invasive ones from their shelves advocate for more action on invasive plants and a better disposal um, process for your neighborhood, for your community. Obviously prevention is the best uh, and the cheapest and most effective thing. So whatever, whenever we can focus on prevention, which is really focused on education, we need to do that. And then controlling the spread. So stopping seeds and root fragments from moving off your property is the next best thing. And then if you can eradicate, that's obviously the the dream goal, but sometimes it's not possible and don't be too hard on yourself if it, if it isn't. Just work towards that if you can. And I always remind myself, it's actually not about removing invasive plants, it's about restoring functioning ecosystems. There are so many amazing wildlife species and plant species here in Canada and they're deeply connected to Indigenous culture and to see those just be removed is heartbreaking in my opinion, and probably in yours too. So these are some pictures of beautiful native species. This is the reason we are trying to uh, control invasive species. Reporting on invasive species in your garden and local natural areas is really important. And two apps that are available are the iNaturalist app and the EDD maps, which stands for early detection. Uh, I always forget what the second D is for. Um, but anyway, that one is, is going to, it's actually right now in the process of expanding to cover more provinces and states. We have a regional map here in Ontario. In British Columbia, EDD maps, it's not there yet, but 
you can report in other ways. So I put that little link at the bottom there. If you go to that website, you can look up what is the best way to report invasive species in your uh, province or territory. And iNaturalist is available, available to everyone in the world. So I think it's super cool. And that's the one that you see that the pictures, the graphic there on the top left. What I tend to do because I wanna support both of these amazing projects is to report with both of them because they're both super quick. I am a Luddite, I have a very old phone, but even I can do this, anyone can do this. They're free, they're easy to use and they're fun. They're gonna help you identify the plant and you also know that you're contributing to science. Here are pictures of three Gromian stead guides that exist in Canada. And there are a couple other provinces, territories that have them as well. So the one on the left is the one that I helped to produce and I use on a lot because it's the one for Southern Ontario, but there's one for BC, for Yukon, on and on. So please go to look Google Gromi instead and see if there's one available for your area. And even if there isn't a Gromi instead guide, you likely have a council in your territory or province, uh, invasive species or invasive plant council that can help you. And here are some links that uh, will be very helpful. The Canadian Council of Invasive Species is the umbrella group for the territorial and province, um, the territory and province councils. Invasive Species Center is that national organization, organization that I mentioned earlier. North American and Native Plant Society I put up there because it has a list of native uh, plant producers. So you can go there and search for the ones that are in your area. And the last two uh, things that I mentioned there are two of my favorite books that talk a lot about specialization and just have the most beautiful pictures and stories about the intimate connection between native plants, native insects and native birds. And so there's no way you can look at those books, read those books, see those pictures and not be inspired to take action on invasive species. And that's it. Thank you so much for your time tonight. That was wonderful, Colleen. And look at you, you finished on time at eight. That's fantastic. I always learn so much uh, when you share your presentations. Thank you. I'm not no sure problem. if you want to um, stop sharing your screen. Sure. And then we'll go through some questions. But before I do, I realized for my first webinar ever, I forgot to introduce myself. So I should just say, hello, I'm Sarah Cooper <laughs> with the Canadian Wildlife Federation. I've been with them for about 20 years on the gardening program. So now that that way, um, we've had a lot of great comments. So thanks everyone for that information. I'll send that on to Colleen uh, afterwards. And a lot of great tips, a lot of great, great dedication out there too with all of you doing so much in your part of the world. Uh, there will be a follow-up email just to say with um, some links, including the link to this recording and some other pertinent things, including a course we've created that Colleen is a part of. She helped us with, it's a very, very basic course for wildlife friendly gardening. Um, but now we should get to the questions because there's a lot of them and they keep growing. So we've got here, we have bindweed lawn despite our best efforts. Um, do you have any help for that? Uh, Kathy talks about how to get rid of, get rid of chickweed. Um, and then another one, do, I don't wanna just quickly touch upon those. They weren't really ones that you were yeah, doing. Um, bindweed, and, bindweed and chickweed are weeds, so they're not technically invasive species, although they can be an absolute pain for gardeners, for landowners, for sure. I haven't personally struggled with them, but I wonder if some of the same techniques that we discussed for the invasive ground covers would work for those uh, weedy ground covers. So you could try tarping. If you don't mind losing that space for a full year, that might be one way to do it. And when you tarp, it, you've got to be really careful that it doesn't come up around the edges of the tarp. So you could try and limit that by removing as much as possible first from digging or cutting, mowing, um, and then also putting some kind of barrier around it so that, because a lot of those things are gonna spread, spread vegetatively. So a barrier is really helpful. I know a tarp can be ugly and I know that as gardeners, we wanna use our gardens constantly, but if you maybe think of it that it'll be one year where you sacrifice a part of your garden, but then you could actually be done with that plant, maybe maybe it's worth it for you. And obviously if your neighbors have that kind of stuff, because I know with me, 
uh, I'm always talking to my neighbors. I give them a lot of free plants. So then they, they let me remove stuff from their gardens because if they don't tackle the, the weeds or the invasives, I'm, I'm just gonna have extra work in my garden. So a um, Great. collaborative effort among neighbors is important. Yeah, I had to do that once with, with something in my garden too. Um, a lot of these questions were written during the presentation. So I think some of these questions have been answered, but one here is what do you do if you see an invasive species growing in a park or woodland? What's the proper protocol? Mm -hmm. Do you call a municipality or how do you, how do you deal with that? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm doing that all the time in Toronto because I'm trying to encourage the city of Toronto to be more active on invasive species. They probably know me by name and they <laughs> avoid everything I, I send them. Um, but I would say do it, do it, do it, do it. I think we really need to hold our governments accountable to do more, take more action on invasive species. So you can um, use the apps that I mentioned that are, that are going to let um, academics, researchers, uh, professional conservation folk know. And then you can usually, at least in Toronto, there's a number 411 that you can call, 311, sorry, that you can call for a number of things. Say you need a new blue bin, say you want to report something. So we were told in Toronto that that is the number you call for to report an invasive plant. But I go further than that because I don't think that really gets me what I want. So I will call, if I know the park, I will find out who the park supervisor is and we'll leave a, send an email or leave a message for them. I rarely actually get to speak to someone, but I think that if you can get a real person and you can get to that person, you might have a better result in the end, other than that just general 311 number that your municipality might put out for all, for any and all um, comments. Okay, great. Um... So uh, again, some of them are have already been covered, but one thing, is it true that by growing native strawberry, it can prevent invasives from growing? You did mention it as an alternative ground cover. I'm not sure how much it yeah. can prevent invasives. But. I'm not so sure I'd say it prevents it, but it's definitely a good option if you have a site where you have tried to remove invasives. However, I mean, I, like I said, I've been fighting these invasives yeah. for for a long, long time, and I have put in aggressive natives and and then I have seen like if I've uh, in natural areas not my garden because I have a garden that's about this big so I can easily manage it but if I go back to say community gardens gardens and parks where I thought that all the invasives were removed we let our guard down we went we went a spring without uh, attending to the invasives then even those uh, aggressive very adaptable natives will they will still they can't magically stop invasives um, mm -hmm. new seeds from germinating yeah so, Definitely, I think that there's all these different tools in our toolbox and aggressive um, uh, plants like uh, wild strawberry are, are one of the tools. It's true. It's, you've got to try different things, don't you, to see what, how yeah. you do. Someone's asking if loofah is an invasive plant and can I grow it in southern Ontario? I recommend actually looking on your invasive plant list uh, with, the account, with the council online to see if it's listed there. Perhaps that's, we can Which check for other sorry? plants. Loofah, the loofah plant. Oh, I don't know. Mm. I don't okay. know, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, let's see. Can a naturalized plant be on a watch list and later become invasive? Yeah, so like I had a picture of um, butterfly, butterfly bush, which is on the watch list of a few, um, for a few provinces. And I think it's invasive in BC, although you, you better check that. Um, okay. But definitely that's how it progresses. Often they're, they might be considered a weed and then they were naturalized and then our climate is changing. We're fragmenting our landscapes more and more. And so something that isn't considered invasive now in 10 years, it might be considered invasive. So we mm -hmm. have to be very careful about non-native plants coming in, yeah. um, even if they appear to be uh, benign now. Although even if they're not invasive, I still think uh, we got to limit their, their um, existence because they're not supportive of our, our native insects. Yeah, which brings me to another good question. What do you think of the wildflower seed mixes that are often sold by nurseries? Do they have invasive plants or native species? That's a really tricky one. My sister, I remember she thought she that I was gonna be very proud of her and she got a mix and put mm -hmm. it down. This was many years ago and it was almost all Dame's Rocket, which is not native and is a weed, perhaps even considered invasive, but I think you have to be really careful. Hopefully, you know, if it's a reputable source, they're going to include the list of species. Um, and sometimes they like those annual, those species that are going to be really showy that first year. But a lot of our natives, their their first year, they're they're focusing on their root development. They're not super um, bushy or 
showy year one, I'd be leery of it. I, I'd for sure only go with it if the species were listed. Yeah. And then I would look at those, uh, check out those species first. Yeah, and often when we do searching, you can write the name of the species, especially in the Latin name, if it's possible, and then write native range and then cross-reference multiple times to really see if we can get a sense there mm -hmm. too. Um, let's see, what do we do when pulling out invasive species with the root materials and seed pods rather than sending to landfill? Should one, oh, wait, someone else yeah. asked this. What about burning? I, I saw some people had comments about burning. There's a few things about burning. Um, I don't do it. I would get in trouble. My husband's a firefighter. Uh, he would not be impressed. And I live in downtown Toronto. My neighbors would all call the police. But I, maybe you're in a more of a rural area, but I can't really comment on it. I have seen other people saying they don't recommend it for different reasons. Um, so I'm sorry, I don't have an answer, but I would say go to the best management practices available from your invasive plant council or invasive species council, because those BMPs, which we call them for short, have come together after often a year or two years of experts, of experienced practitioners hashing it out and coming up with the best advice. So mm -hmm. we don't have to keep trying to figure it out ourselves. There are some incredible resources out there. So Great. I would say go to your local council and look for the resources there. Great. And someone's asking, I was at a local well-known nursery today, which had a large display of periwinkle. I didn't say anything. Should I? Oh my gosh, that's a tricky one. I don't know where you're located, but um, with the Grow Me Instead guide a few years ago, now probably about 10 years ago, we did this really cool nursery outreach program. So we found the mom and pop nurseries, unfortunately about half of them are now no longer in existence, but they were actually so um, open to the idea of promoting our guide and putting up signs in their stores to say, these are the plants that are, if you're gonna plant this, don't plant it near a natural area. And here's an alternative that you might wanna try. Uh, but for the big box stores, it's hard because what are you going to talk to the 17 year old that's working there part time? I don't know who you would go to. It's also, I think, dependent on how those stores purchase their plants. And Sarah actually is with Canadian Wildlife Federation, and they probably have some good connections with the big box stores, right? And how they decide to purchase their plants. Um, so I would say if you're up for it, you could bring your local Grow Me Instead guide and try to have a conversation with the person that purchases the plants or at least the store manager. But it is tricky because some people will get defensive right away. Yeah, you got to play it by ear, see what the people are like, how it feels. And yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, speaking up is great for consumer power, but as you say, you got to really play that one by ear. Mm -hmm. um, none of the species yeah. you mentioned are considered invasive in to where I live. Is this because they haven't spread as much or the government just hasn't given them the designation? What if anything can be done to change that? Should these plants not be banned? from being sold at garden centers. Hmm. Banning, oh my goodness. So in the States, there have been sta um, some States that have banned uh, certain plants. And then the industry lobby, the horticulture industry lobby have, uh, in some cases, those bans have been uh, revoked. So the banning, uh, there doesn't seem to be an appetite for that in Ontario, at least. There aren't any groups working on that. And so we're really focusing on grassroots stuff, education, and connecting horticulturists and ecologists. And I'd have to say that that is why I love working on the Grow Me Instead, because it's two separate worlds that I'm part of, because I love to garden and I love ecology. And so I get to bring them both together with this. And it was tricky at first, because ecologists and horticulturists are not always on the same page. But now they've worked on this guide three, they've done three of those guides together. And there's nothing like a face-to-face -face conversation starting from a point um, like we all love plants and that's a good place to start that conversation. The banning hasn't, it doesn't seem to be something anyone is pushing here in Canada, but if you do some research, you'll see in the States, some of those States have attempted it. I can't say how successful they've been. Yeah, thanks. And it leads into another good question. What is a good source for learning the varieties of native plants that should be planted in gardens? Oh, um, I'm not sure where you're located, but uh, there there might be a local group here in Toronto. There are so many cool groups that are starting up that are just neighbors getting together, growing native plants in their backyards, sharing those native plants, collecting the seeds in the fall and distributing those. I'm part of one called Project Swallowtail here in West Toronto. So I would look for a native plant group or even a naturalist group in your area. Um, there's just so much that's available online. And now it feels like also that just 
it feels like all of a sudden native plants are getting their their due um attention at least in yeah, some definitely. areas in canada yeah and you know the canadian wildlife federation has an encyclopedia online you can look yeah. to search there's also a great resource it uh, used to be evergreens and then it got mm. taken over by this firm who that revitalized it called can plant that's a fantastic one for finding native plants too so as colleen says go local see what you can find there lots of great resources online some great uh, mm. databases and such um you mentioned can i show this one plant oh yes uh, yeah. Pollinators of native plants. This is a woman from Ontario who now lives in Minnesota, Heather Holm. Amazing. She is a horticulturalist and a bee ecologist. So what an incredible combination of, of skills and knowledge. She's also a fantastic um, writer and photographer. So this is more for northeastern um, Canada, um, sorry, eastern Canada. So I don't know if it would work in BC, but perhaps there's something like that for you. But it's just fantastic. Sorry to interrupt Sarah, but it's okay. so very practical because it goes through each and every plant and tells you what the best combination is with other plants, what the best environment is, and which specialist bees you're going to be attracting with the plants. So if you live in around me in Ontario, please check out this book. I think you'll really um, enjoy it. I'm glad you said that because Heather Holm actually is giving a webinar um, April the 10th for us oh, that's on great. beneficial insects and bees for the vegetable and fruit garden as well as you know general natives in on your property so i highly Perfect. recommend you check that out it will not be recorded so you will have to attend it live if you want to participate um and there's people mentioning good books courses one by lorraine johnson people are mentioning that yes is mm -hmm. definitely a good book a lot of great a lot of good books out there now and i've seen yeah. them specialized for the prairie garden for the you know eastern coast gardens and bc etc mm -hmm. so yeah. um did you mentioned tarping just to confirm would that work for english ivy yeah, uh, but I, I would, with English ivy, I would try if possible to um, dig it or clip it first, or mm -hmm. especially around like the edges of the tarp, because I, I have just experienced that at the, the cottage where I am, that every time I think I have done the best job on English mm -hmm. ivy, it comes back. So I have been digging. And then last year, what I did, instead of plastic, I found all, I, there was a dead tree that had shed all this bark. So I put down huge pieces of bark and then really thick um, leaf litter. And I did that in the summer and the fall. And we'll see, I haven't been back to the cottage in a while. So we'll see if the if it's done any good or if I'm back to square one. So like I said, I'm really still learning. <laughs> I think we all are. I think we always will be with so much in life. I keep discovering yeah. new things. So it's quarter past eight. I'll just maybe uh, pick a few more and then we've got to wrap it up. I'm so sorry we can't get to all these calls. It's such a popular topic. Just a, I live in Toronto in the ravines as a big vine, not dog strangling vine, which goes up the trees and almost seems to pull them down. Do you know what it could be? Um, well, there's there are a few native vines. I don't know if it's Virginia oh. creeper or wild grape or um, oh, there's a non-native one, uh, bittersweet. There's a native bittersweet, but the one we see in Toronto in the ravines is often Asian bittersweet, but I don't think it pulls down. It's not strong enough to pull anything down. So I'm not sure which one you're talking about. Okay. Um, but I see wild grape a lot, which is, is actually great food for birds and uh, Virginia creeper is native. It can get quite high up in the trees. And I'm sorry if you, if you answer this Colleen, um, cause sometimes I was paying attention to the chat. Mm -hmm. We have a large patch of garlic mustard, which we've been pulling for five years. We heard we could weed whack it instead of spending days digging. Sounds like we should also pick up all the pieces and garbage them thoughts. Okay. So so the, there's mixed um, messages here. So what I often did was I just referred to what the municipalities and the best management practices offer, but some people do leave stems if they're not yet flowering on the property. Um, I don't know, stewards will often do that because they cover a big area and it's just too much to bring all of the debris out. So if it's um, early on in the season and they, there's no roots attached to the stems and no seeds, Yet, um, maybe you could leave it there and see what happens. Um, I kind of err on the side of caution that I'd probably want to get it out. Also because those leaves, uh, those stems will have the residual chemicals that can be antifungal. So why not, if you can remove it, do so. Okay. I see one here, which is a really good point. They asked the landscaper to design a perennial garden whose purpose is to attract birds and pollinators. Their proposed plants are attracted to them, but not native to my area. 
more horticulturally oriented. Would you recommend against doing this, even though birds would be attracted, which is my main objective? And I think mm -hmm. got oh, a good gosh, I, here. I would I would advise against it because like when I worked with the Conservation Authority, if you can believe it, we were planting autumn olive and Russian olive to attract birds. And it is true, the birds love, well, the birds will consume that fruit often because there isn't an alternative for them. However, baby birds require insects. Something mm -hmm. like 95% of our songbirds, uh, when they're young, they don't consume berries or hard shelled insects. They want the larva, the inchworms, the larva of moth and, and butterfly species. And so you need the native plants that are gonna support those high protein, high fat, juicy insects. Um, and that are going to feed our songbirds. You can't have birds, adult birds, without the baby songbirds being properly fed so that they can fledge and be successful. And then birds, their diets will diversify in time. So you don't want to just feed an adult bird. You want to feed birds throughout their life cycle. And to do that, you definitely need native plants. Thank you. Um, let's see. Um, a couple of people have asked the la average lifespan of dog strangling vines. So I figured we should address that. Oh my gosh, that's a really good question. And I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know what the lifespan is. It's they're always, I always see it as a monoculture. And so I can't, <laughs> it's just always this mass or this mat of dog strangling vine. And I don't know what an individual plant, how long it might last. I'm sorry. Okay. Can't know everything. <laughs> so I have a number of buckthorn growing in our 25 acres next to a creek. Should I start on one area at a time or cut down all the big plants first to stop further spread? Any thoughts there? I would start with um, flagging or putting tape around the females that are producing seed, uh, producing berries, and um, also get familiar with the seedlings, what the seedlings look like. So if you flag somehow all of your adult trees, and that way you can, and maybe use like pink for female and yellow for male. And then you can be a little strategic. You can't get to it in one year. You can't get to it in two years. So focus on removing the little seedlings, getting really familiar what they look like. And you'll see those around the parent um, shrub or small tree. And then also when you're removing the big ones, focusing on the female. First. Great. Now, someone's asked here, where do you get the books of uh, Chromium Stead? You can actually download them, can't you? Yeah. Free online. Yeah. Online, online rather. Yeah. In Ontario, it's at the uh, Ontario Invasive Plant Council's website. And British Columbia is at their council website. So again, go to your council's website, mm -hmm. whatever your territory or province is, and you, you'll be able to find it there. Great. One last one, I think, because we do need to end. Uh, what is a polite way to tell neighbors without offending when they're growing invasive, such as burning bush shrubs? Okay, that is so huge because I failed at that for 10, 15 years. And now <laughs> I bring them cookies or yeah. honestly, I offer them plants because I always, as a gardener, am growing way too much. I have no business growing as many plants as I do. So if you bring someone a little black eyed Susan plant or a wild columbine and you start with that and you say like hey if you put this in here you're probably going to get this and then and then like not going straight to the criticism or the demand but working on that <laughs> that relationship first and being generous and then um so my one neighbor I finally got her growing native plants because she was now participating in project swallowtail and it's she's not a gardener and she never will be but she's gotten a little bit um, more understanding and, and more supportive of it. I do do a little bit of work in her property. So, so that helps too. <laughs> well, listen, this has been wonderful. And people have been asking about, will they get a copy or the link to this recording? And yes, you will in about a week when the recording is up online, I'll send out an email and you'll get that and a bunch of other links that hopefully you'll find helpful. And uh, Colleen, you have been awesome. We've had a lot of great comments from people thanking you for all this information and thank you guys also for participating some great information yeah, thank you so well. much so thank you so much i really appreciate it no problem yeah thank you sarah and thank you so much everyone for participating great take care everyone take care bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.